Hello, Breach from Catonia Podcast, and this is Monday, and we are doing this uh, uh, live stream, as I usually do. Today is, in the U.S. at least, we're referring to this as Eclipse Day, because today is the day of the solar eclipse. Uh, now, where I live, I am not in the path of totality, but uh, we're supposedly going to get, I don't know, I, I, I keep hearing different percentages. I thought somebody had said 90%. Some people kind of said 80. We don't, we're not actually going to see totality here where I live, but we will see the beginning as it's moving into phase, probably like two o'clock-ish and then like two, two fifteen, something like that. And then I think it kind of mo moves across and eventually moves out of range after something like 430. So yeah, so we've got this this eclipse that's that's happening today. Uh, right now, the skies are very, very clear. Uh, we'll see whether or not we see anything. I do actually have my um, eclipse glasses that I had gotten. Uh, again, just in case, I don't know how much of it we're really gonna see, but I figure I would, if I'm gonna look at any of it, I'm, <laughs> you don't wanna look at that with the, with the naked eye. <clears throat> and in fact, um, the glasses I have are supposed to be, uh, they meet the transmission requirements of 12312-2, which is the filter for direct observation of the sun. So if you do have glasses, make sure, and you are in the path and you are planning to look at the eclipse, do make sure that you have glasses that meet that standard. So uh, I am going to talk about the eclipse today, and I'm going to be talking about uh, eclipse mythologies. Uh, in particular, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about some more general ones, but then I'm also going to go in and be talking a little bit about um, specifically the mythology that, that comes from India about Rahu Ketu and, and the eclipses, because I feel like that one, uh, I mean, there's, there, you're going to see a common theme to a lot of these different myths, but, um, but there's also, uh, I want to get into uh, th that particular myth, um, kind of takes me in another direction with regard to, uh, some, some additional comments on a previous live stream that I did regarding voice and authenticity of voice. Um, there's also something else to note about this particular eclipse, and that is that it is, if you are following the astrological aspects of it, it is conjunct Chiron, which is an asteroid. Now, Chiron has been in Aries for quite a long time. Um, in, in my, my astrological chart, my Chiron is in, is natally in Aries. So, and people who have, a Chiron has to do with wounds or the wound. Okay, so whatever your personal wound is, wherever you feel like you're rejected, not understood, not heard, that's all connected to Chiron. That's your Chiron linkage or the things that you are the most insecure about. So just think about the fact that there's a solar eclipse going on, which is already kind of a disturbed event, at least from a spiritual or mythological standpoint. Generally, eclipses are not considered to be auspicious. We kind of have two camps of people out here. You have the people who are like, yay, eclipse, and they're like going and they're going to hotels and staying place and, and wanting to wanting to see it. And it's understandable. I mean, it's exciting. It's not, it's a, it's a very rare event. It's very rare that we see eclipses here in the U.S. They're not rare generally. You have eclipses every year. There are usually um, two solar eclipses and two lunar eclipses every year. There's an eclipse season every year, okay? Um... And then you have some people in the other opposite camp who are thinking like, oh, the rapture's coming and now all the sinners are going to be picked up and Satan's trying to come in the world and CERN is doing this and NASA's doing this and, you know, and there's all kinds of that BS that's going on as well. Um, and so that's, um, I mean, yes, it is rather interesting that CERN is, is starting their experiments today. It's also rather interesting that NASA is firing these rockets, but I don't know. But the idea that there's a lot of people trying to interpret this Particular, I mean, I'm, I'm always big on looking for signs in nature and so forth, but a lot of people are trying to take this eclipse and trying to say, oh, look, there was an earthquake the other day, so that means, you know, this is this is a sign of the rapture, the world's ending. I'm like, yeah, no, it's not. Um, I did a live stream yesterday on uh, my Transition Life Coaching channel, taking more, looking at this more from a strictly astrological point of view and sort of connecting it more to some of the other work that I do over there. So that is over on my Liminal Tarot channel if people are interested in, in seeing that or transition.life.coaching. You can watch that live stream over there. The recording is over there if you want to talk about that. But what I'm going to be talking more about today is going to be just more about the, the mythologies and so forth. Because Catonia, we, what, of course, what do I deal with here? I deal with the dark feminine. And so that's going to be the lens through which I'm going to be looking at this kind of story. And, and some of the connections are really quite interesting. 
Um, just a little bit of Catonia news. I always like to kind of throw it out there. Um, I do have another new podcast coming out next week. At the moment, I'm still not going to tell you what it's on. <laughs> um, I have to do my re my research this week and, uh, and and work on that. But I'll probably be do doing that starting tomorrow. Uh, so uh, yeah, so a new podcast will be coming out next weekend. Um, my merch store is up. Some people have been buying the merch and ordering it and telling me that they've gotten it and it's great and, and all that. So this is that's really good. I have more merch coming in, more sample merch coming in from uh, spring. Uh, I think I just got a notification that it's going to be delivered. So I'll have more merch to show off here on the channel. Um, but that link is in my bio here for uh, Catonia Podcast on Instagram. I do have the link. And if people are watching this on YouTube, I will have the link for that in the description. I'm actually trying to set up the spring store on you on, on um, the Catonia channel on YouTube. But, you know, in true Mercury retrograde fashion, because we're in the middle of that too, uh, it doesn't, it, it's gotten all screwed up and the buttons that were supposed to appear are not appearing. And then it's saying, oh, we don't sell this merchandise in the United States. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, of course you do. It's it's just, it's it's just, um, and it's a store that they literally partner with, affiliate with, and integrate with, but but we don't sell their merchandise. Um, so anyway, I don't know. It, maybe that'll have sorted itself out, but I'm working towards doing that over there as well. Um, fun bit of news I did get, I've been, I put in a Kickstarter for this, um, probably a couple of years ago now. And finally, I've gotten my Austin Osmond Spare tarot deck. So those of you who are fans of uh, Spare will, will understand why this is such a cool thing. And, um, you know, the deck is really uh, definitely... Um, Spare is kind of known to, for being a, um, a chaos magician. And he is, and, and so he was the one, we talk about the idea of spare sigils, you know, um, and, uh, and I see, I see JR. Hi, JR. I was just talking about you because, um, actually the, I was just talking about the Catonia store and all of the designs in there, which of course were actually designed by JR Malpair, um, who is a, a brilliantly talented artist. He's really, um, I mean, his, his stuff is just amazing. And so the, the, the beautiful designs that he does are actually, um, yeah, are, are thanks to him. Uh, because I, I do I do artwork of my own, but it doesn't it doesn't approach the kind of stuff that he does, which is really good. So, um, and it's uh, oh, you're welcome. Um, but it's but yeah. So we so we've got all this going on, and like I said, I think I had I was just saying yeah, I got my my new spare tarot deck. So I'm I'm very excited to get working with this. It is a little bit different because he uses uh, more playing cards type things. He uses like um, clubs and spades and. Uh, hearts and things like that. So, and it doesn't, he doesn't always cross translate it from what I've seen so far, the same way that one does with tarot. Not that it really matters, but, um, but yeah, but this came in today. I've gotten it through a Kickstarter and I don't know. Um, I'm just looking, I see there's an ISBN number on it. It's published by Strange Attractor Press. So people who are interested in spare and his kind of uh, the spare sigils, chaos magic, things like that. And, and uh, maybe fans of the, uh, that, um, they do have this deck available now. Um, and I don't know, you know, how widely it's being being sold, but it's strangeattractor.co.uk. So um, anyway, so that came in today. That was kind of exciting. Okay, so that's that's a little bit of the the Catonia news. I have been laying low this past week. I've just not um, not been very high energy on a lot of things, uh, and I have a lot of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I'm kind of reviewing, going through, still trying to get cover art sorted out for the books that I have coming out later this year. Um, and that's been, it, it's always a, a major go around with Ingram because there, there's no, there's no useful way to work with any of their templates. Um, and my sister, who was a graphic artist for many years, told me, she goes, I hate templates. She says they, they, they suck, but you know, but I, I have to use it. I can't, um, I don't have, I don't have all the InDesign tools and things like that. I have other Adobe tools, but I don't have that. So, um, that's been a bit of a, bit of a headache, but um, so yeah, so that's kind of when, what my week's been like. And today, of course, with the eclipse, I, uh, as somebody who sort of accedes to Hinduism in a lot of ways, I, I tend to lay low during the eclipse. I don't I don't like to do a whole lot of stuff. So I pretty much, other than doing this live stream, and I actually did do a reading for somebody this morning, I kind of cleared my calendar a bit, uh, for today at least. So let's talk a little bit about eclipses and about eclipse mythology before I get into some of the other stuff that's been, that people are saying and that's going on. Um, so, okay, so let me start first with things like, okay, like in Chinese mythology, for example, when we talk about an eclipse, we are thinking that this is the idea that there is a dragon that is devouring the sun. 
And so the way that eclipses are generally managed in China is that people like, you know, make very loud noises. They bang, you know, things they yell loudly, you know, they, they do things to try to scare off the dragon from swallowing the sun. Okay. This, this idea of the sun being devoured is, is quite a common one. Um, now, now one of the things that I've not seen in some of the, just kind of looking through some of the mythologies, I, I'm, what's coming into my mind is the ancient um, Mithraic idea, which was the, uh, and, and really that comes out of uh, Babylonian thinking, you know, the Gilgamesh and, and, and things like that, where you have the idea of the moon bowl, of the moon bowl that, that sort of charges at the sun um, and has to be you know, fought off or, or conquered. Okay, so then that's the idea of that there's a fight or an attack you know, between the, um, between the moon and the, um, and the sun, you know, that, that this is, that this is another uh, way of doing it. Uh, the West African take also on eclipses is that the idea is that the sun and the moon are in a fight. And I believe the way that they handle eclipses is that they would say everybody in the village, even if they were warring tribes, everybody would behave peacefully in, in, you know, to kind of show the sun and the moon that, you know, how to behave peacefully so that they, you know, that one doesn't destroy the other. Okay, uh, certainly among Inca beliefs, you have the idea the the sun in a lot of the um, Mesoamerican kind of uh, mythologies was considered to be, of course, a, a great benefic, one that had to be protected, sometimes protected from other celestial forces that might have been considered hostile. Like a lot of the uh, celestial realm was considered to be demonic and to be, um, you know, that's the word we use now, but it was considered to be uh, malevolent, or, malevolent or hostile towards the sun. And uh, so, but, but eclipses were viewed as the sun's displeasure. So this was one of those things that if there was an eclipse blocking the sun, that meant the sun was angry. And so you had to, um, it, usually there was some kind of a sacrifice that had to be made or something had to be done. And certainly in that culture also, the emperor would, you know, would withdraw for the day. There would be no activities. There would be um, no official duties going on. Like everybody would kind of pull back from the uh from their regular duties when it came to uh, the eclipse which generally again in in a lot of cultures that's considered to be the thing to do other than the ones that are out there shouting and banging things together to try to make whatever whatever dragon or snake or uh, or whatever fight is going on to try to uh, get the to keep the sun from being devoured uh, that would be the um the way in which, the, otherwise, it tends to be a day of withdrawal where people don't don't do a lot of things because the energy is considered to be very unsettled. Um, there's a couple of Native American ones that are interesting. Um, the Choctaw have the idea that there is a black squirrel that is actually trying to eat the sun. It's another one of those devouring the sun things. And again, they make noises to try to frighten away this squirrel, um, which I, I think is funny. And um, I think I follow uh, Gray Squirrel Ceramic here on Instagram. Um, I think he particularly would find that. He, I used to work with him. He he'll, he would find that really funny, I think. But the idea that there is a this this black squirrel that's actually trying to devour the sun, which I find interesting. And there's another Native American legend about there's it's either usually characterized as a young boy or as a dwarf who gets sunburned or gets burned by the sun. So in order to take revenge on the sun, uh, tries to trap it. And um, all of the other be you know have a, beings have a hard time freeing the sun from this trap. Uh, but then a little mouse comes in, and the mouse, because it's able to gnaw through whatever those straps are, or whatever on the trap, is able to free the sun, and then you know uh, it, it escapes from from that trap. But but again, the idea of an eclipse uh, as either an act of displeasure or an act of uh, being um, the eclipse occurring as an act of revenge by some being. Uh, so in, in any case, all of these cases, we're looking at something that is uh, fairly inauspicious. In fact, the Egyptians didn't talk about eclipses at all. If, you know, you'd be surprised because there's, there's a whole lot around sun and sun worship, certainly when we're talking about, um, you know, the, the certain, certain um, elements of the, um, of the New Kingdom uh, in Egypt when you had the um, Akhenaten and you had this, uh, the idea of, of sun worship. It was, it, it was a sort of a quasi-monotheism that we had that was eventually pushed out again for, for a period of time uh, towards what I guess they call the Armana period. I guess that's the period that we're talking about there. Um, so you will have this idea of um, this, uh, yeah. It, so, but interestingly, when eclipses occurred, Egyptians didn't even write about them. I mean, maybe it was an idea of, you know, well, we don't even talk about that. 
um, you do have the idea of um, this. You, you know, there's always the, the nightly idea of the sun being devoured um, by, by Apep or by some of the, uh, the forces, the, the crocodile in, in, the, in the underworld when the sun makes his night journey. And of course, you have all these beings that are there to protect the sun so that the sun will um, leave, re return from his journey in the morning. So that, but that's part of the regular sunrise sunset kind of a thing. Eclipses in particular were not really discussed in ancient Egypt per se. Um, what was the other one I wanted to mention? I made a few notes for myself. Um, okay, yeah, those were those were some of the main ones that have been talked about. But the one I want to talk about in particular is the one from India, and this is the myth of Rahu Rahu Ketu. Now. Um, Anybody who follows astrology uh, knows that the difference between Western and, well, Western, what we call tropical astrology, and then there's what they call sidereal astrology, which is, um, you know, Vedic, or what is, what is done in India. And there's, there's a difference between the, um, the calculations, because one is based on where the sun is at the vernal equinox, at the spring equinox, so zero degrees of Aries, okay? That's where one is, is based on, and that's the one that we use here in, you know, in the United States, in, in what we think of as the West, quote unquote, uh, that's what, that's the type of astrology that's typically used. And it's based on that. So everything has a fixed position. So Aries is, you know, March 19th or 20th to April 20th, um, April 20th to May 20th is Taurus and, and, and so on and so forth. There's, there's sometimes a difference of a day or two, but strictly speaking, um, it's the same time frame roughly. Uh, but it doesn't correspond to the actual position of the uh, constellations in the sky. Uh, sidereal uh, astrology does, uh, Vedic astrology does. So it's about 23 degrees different from this um, kind of tropical system that, that works uh, on the equinoxes. So, uh, it's a, so that one, it, some people think Vedic astrology for that reason is more correct or more true. I mean, both of them actually do have a value if you do follow astrology and you do like it. Um, uh, I feel like Vedic astrology somehow can get, and maybe you, you can do this with Western astrology, but you can get this level of granularity in reading a chart that just is almost insane. And I've, I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to um, re reiterate that, but Vedic astrology can, can get really, really detailed. It doesn't just tell you, you know, what your sun sign and your personality is. I mean, and, and of course, Western astrology does more than that as well, but it, it really can get into the granularity of like, I remember, for instance, going to a Vedic astrologer for the first time and having him say, oh, your father had pneumonia last month. Like, like really detailed kind of stuff, okay? So uh, within Vedic astrology, um, we have this idea of Rahu and Ketu. And in Western astrology, that is known as the North Node and the South Node of the Moon, okay? Now, in Vedic astrology, they are conceived of as the head and tail of a dragon, okay? And this dragon, uh, basically, it is a, a Ashura, which we, we usually use the word demon for Ashura. And again, that's not quite the correct translation. Ashura is definitely a more materialistic being, one that's not um, not connected so much to uh, what you might think of as celestial or divine kind of energy. It's more materialistic, more more about the kind, it, it, it tends to, Ashuric energy represents more um, our, our grappling for material things, our desire for money, our desire for uh, sensual pleasure, which it's not, I mean, the Ashuras are there, they exist. Okay, sorry, we had, we had a pause due to a poor connection. It's funny how, you know, doing this during Mercury Retrograde, but it's, um, and I did actually reset my connection to try to keep that from happening. Hopefully it won't happen again. Um, so anyway, sorry about that. Um, so Rahu Ketu are, um, they, they basically are the head and the tail of a dragon because they are actually this, this Ashuric being that has been cut in half. And they, and they kind of, they flank the moon, they flank the earth, and they are able to have an effect on the earth. Now, the reason they can do this is, uh, or the, the, the story goes back, uh, we end up connecting this with Eclipse mythology. Um, so what happens is there was a, there was a feast of, of the devas, the gods, in uh, the Hinduism. And the gods have access to the ocean of Amrita. And Amrita is the word for, it's actually basically the nectar of immortality. Okay, so when you talk about Amrita, it's that which brings that which is eternal. And now Ashuras, by nature, because they deal with temporal things, they, they have a lifespan. Like they don't, they're not immortal. They don't, they don't live forever. 
but there was a demon, and this one happens to be who we identify with, Rahu, who goes by the name uh, uh, Sarbanu, uh, who man disguises himself as a woman, which I find which I find interesting. Disguises himself as a woman, and sits among the devas. And so when the Amrita is being handed out in cups for the, the gods to drink, Svabanu ends up getting drinking this cup of like this elixir of immortality. And then but um it's Vishnu who actually notices um and says that this, you know, because Vishnu remember is the preserver of things. So, you know, the while the Ashuras exist and they have a place. Whenever the, the Shuras have a reason to um, be aggrandized or to, um, they, to, to have a way to gain power, then usually it's, it's like any kind of impulse that we have. It can, it can get out of control. You know, we come into a lot of money. Sometimes it's not enough money. Now we've got to have more. Um, if we you know, have a lot of something, you know, we, we can become very greedy uh, for things. Uh, that that's like the mythology of Raktavija uh, or Raktavera, who is the seed of desire. You know, you kill him and you make a hundred more of him. It's that kind of energy that says, um, you know, even when I have enough or more than enough, it's never enough. Okay, so that's that's what the Ashuric energy is kind of like. Um, and so, yeah, so the idea of an Ashura drinking the, ne the nectar of immortality or becoming immortal. Uh, that's a problem because then you're dealing with a being that you can't really deal with or get rid of. So what ends up happening is um, it's I believe it is Vishnu who draws a sword and cuts the head off of Slavanu, who we also think of as uh, as Rahu. And so yeah, so now now you, you you're basically you've got this headless being that is immortal. And so now this being is placed in the sky around the earth because you can't you can't kill this dragon okay this basically um rahu this, this being is, ends up being represented as kind of a snake figure okay and so since it's cut in half you have the head that influences one thing and then you have the tail and the tail is often known as k2 okay and k2 uh, is often considered to be like a shadow planet and in fact rahu and k2 act in vedic astrology as navagrahas or they act as planets planetary forces because each of the planets um, are deities in their own right, and they have their own pujas that you would say. Um, so when you're going through, for example, your your Sati or your very difficult Saturn period, uh, you might have a Shani or, or Saturn puja said regularly to, to try to appease the gods who alleviate the whatever the most difficult aspects are of your uh, of the transition that you're going through. Um, I know when I first went to a Vedic astrologer, I was in Ketu, what they call a Mahadasha. I was in Ketu, Ketu Mahadasha. And Ketu, Ketu is interesting because, okay, as the tail of the dragon, it doesn't have a head, so it's not able to see or think, okay? Um, and Ketu often has to do with limitations. Again, in, in Western astrology, they associate that with the South Node, which was typically associated with karmic debt, with past lives, with uh, ancestral stuff that we carry with us. It's like that that tail <laughs> kind of that, that comes with us, the, 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 that, 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 uh, that back part there. But there's no head. So K2 is not able to see or think or, you know, um, but K2, the K2 phase is definitely connected to liberation. It's connected to the idea that uh, of that is the phase during which, actually that's the phase during which I started doing Kali worship very heavily. Um, and I was very, very drawn to that because I was working through a period of time where the focus was on liberation. So, uh, and that's the time when I met my guru also was during Ketu Mahadasha. So that's the idea of the, the liberating influence that can come in at that period of time. So Ketu, these forces are not, it's not a matter of these are good and evil forces, okay? Which is what I, one of the things that I always try to point out. Rahu and Ketu, while they may be considered inauspicious in some ways, they are not considered to be evil. Now, Rahu is the head. So basically, Rahu is like a head without a body, okay? And Rahu, because Rahu is all head, all in his head, um, Rahu tends to have a very aggrandized view of things. People who have like a first house Rahu tend to be very narcissistic people. They don't have to be, but that is that is a, a distinct possibility with somebody who has that in their chart. And now in Western astrology, the North Node is supposed to be about where you're going. So you have the idea of the tails back here and the heads going this way. But the head and the tail actually... Um, yeah, they're, they're separated. So again, this idea of separation too, where we, you know, it's, it's either this or it's that, like we're not, 
and, and when you think dualistically like that and when you don't see the whole picture what you end up doing is you, you kind of fall into this you, this, you, you fall into this dualism you this dualistic space where um you you ha you have one piece of the puzzle but not the other i guess is kind of how it is you're not really seeing how the whole thing how it only fits together and uh, now with card to eclipses what happened was it, it was said that it was uh, the sun and the moon who actually ratted out um Ra you know rahu or uh Svabanu for being in there they're saying hey that's that's not one of the gods you know that that per that person doesn't belong there and then that's when you know got beheaded so Rahu, in his anger at both uh, Surya and Tundra, who are the sun and the moon, uh, now goes to battle with them. And it's said that when eclipses happen, that this this battle of Rahu Ketu um, is when is when this particular dragon or serpent tries to swallow either the sun or the moon. Now Ketu is always associated with lunar eclipses, so he's associated with the uh, yeah. So the tail is associated with lunar eclipses. Rahu is associated with solar eclipses. Okay, and uh, particularly. Although, from what I was hearing the other day, listening to um, Komila Sutton, who's one of the Vedic astrologies that, uh, astrologers that I, that I follow, I think there, there are different eclipses that can be Rahu, Rahu or Ketu based. I don't know. My understanding is that, yeah, but I've also seen that Rahu tends to, tends to be uh, largely associated with uh, solar eclipses. So what it is, is the idea is you have this head of this dragon. It's a head that's trying to swallow the sun. But because he's only a head and has no neck, um, it just kind of passes through and then the sun comes out on the other side. So the eclipse is actually, um, you know, Rahu's failed attempt to try to eat the sun, is what it comes down to. And uh, so what happens then? What happens in Hindu thinking when you have Rahu Ketu um, going on and when you have this, this, this unsettled energy of Rahu trying to devour the sun, okay, in, in, in the, you know, figuratively speaking here? Um, or mythologically speaking, I should say. So what what ends up, the way that it's supposed to be handled is that, again, as, as I think I was sort of saying at the beginning of this live stream, this is not a time to be out partying. It's not supposed to be a time when you are, and, and you know, it, like I said, the reactions to it are very, very interesting. They're kind of going from the very fearful to uh, the, yay, party time eclipse. Um, and again, understanding that it's a cool event to be able to see. It's cool to be able to watch a, a, a you know, to see something like this because lunar eclipses are somewhat common here, but, but solar eclipses, especially uh, total solar eclipses, are not. So you, you understand why people are getting all excited about it. Of course, for some people, it's becoming a, a capitalistic opportunity. Like, I think it's Sun Chips is putting out um, a special, like, black chip that's, or, like, it's, like, that, that purple thing that's supposed to approximate black and... It's only going to be out during the eclipse. And I'm like, so you're going to put this out for four minutes? Because <laughs> totality only lasts for four minutes, right? There's a lot of people jumping on the consumerist bandwagon. Uh, and I know certainly I saw that anybody who was in any hotels in the path of totality, even if you were like in Missouri, I mean, you know, not places where people, we're not talking big cities or places that people frequent all the time, you know, Erie, Pennsylvania. I mean, it, it's like, it, not, not your general tourist stopovers let's let's just say um they have hotel rooms going for like six seven eight hundred dollars a night because they know they're going to have all these eclipse people a lot of places also had these um what was it they, they oh yeah they had a state of emergency warnings um about the day of the eclipse because they felt like okay you're, you're these all these people are going to descend on our town and we may not have enough resources especially down in texas where they have difficulties with the electrical grid and stuff like that. They're saying, be careful, there could be blackouts, there could be, you know, all this kind of stuff going on just because of the eclipse and not because of the actual phenomenon itself, but all the people coming to see it. Um, and the other aspect of this, as I, I talked about in my other live stream the other day, it was the people who think that this is a sign of the end times, which it's not. I mean, that's, that's the short answer to that. Um, it's, and, and what they do is they will point to the fact that there was an earthquake um, and we had, it was here in New Jersey, we had it. Um, it was a 4.8, uh, it was funny, I was sitting in my room uh, working on some writing and there was, the town was in kind of a miracle in and of itself, was outside patching the road. And I was like, ooh, you're gonna fill in the potholes, really? Um, 
I mean, they'll they'll do it sometime. I don't I don't want to pick on our DPW because they're actually pretty good guys. But um, but yeah, but we just had these massive holes in the road, and they were they were out fixed. You know, I guess maybe got more complaints and say they were out fixing them. And all of a sudden, my whole house just shook violently. And I remember my first thought was not there's an earthquake going on. My first thought was what are they doing out there? Like you know, like you're filling in potholes. Like they don't need to do you know anything crazy here. And of course I went and I looked out the window and they weren't doing anything crazy, but my house was shaking. And I'm like, this is weird. Um, and then about 10 minutes later, I get a phone call from my mom and she's just like, uh, hi, was your house just shaking? And I was like, yeah, it was yours. And so that's when we all kind of put the dead and I was like, okay, now, now I need to, that's when you go start Googling it, right? Or you go onto social media and everyone's like, hey, earthquake. So yeah, it was a 4.8, which is actually quite high for New Jersey. It's a moderate, it's close to a moderate. Moderate would be a five and above. So this is just slightly below that, but it's close to being a moderate earthquake. Uh, now, it wasn't one that really did any damage. Uh, I know I did see some people post pictures where they did have some structural damage in their house, like, you know, cracks in the walls and things. And I know that there was, it's kind of like emergency operations put together to be for people who probably, it's probably the equivalent of like a FEMA type thing. Um, maybe even is FEMA, I don't know, where people can potentially get money. Um, a lot of insurance companies don't cover earthquake. Uh, usually, like if, you, like if you live in Southern California, you have to have special earthquake insurance. Uh, my sister used to live there. She used to live on the San Andreas Fault, literally on the San Andreas Fault. So something like this, she was just like, she actually lives in New Jersey now, and she said, you know, I moved. I thought I was going to get away from this. But we had one there, and then there was apparently some aftershocks, and then six o'clock in the evening, I was leaving a WhatsApp message for someone and all of a sudden my house shook again. And I was like, oh, there's another one. This one was only a four, it wasn't quite as big, but it was interesting, two in one day. And um, now, but here's the thing, cause that, so everybody was looking at this and because it affected New York, it's like, oh, New York, it happened in New York. That means it's something, you know, everybody pay attention to it. It's happening in New York. And uh, that's that's like a media phenomenon that seems to exist in the US. If it's happening in New York, then then it's big, right? Um, but it's really not that big. It didn't do anything. It didn't, didn't knock out bridges, didn't do, you know, didn't knock anything in electrical. I mean, nothing. It did nothing. It's just, um, you know, it, it was just, it was just a shake and everybody kind of went, whoa. And that was, for the most part, that was it. I mean, there might be some minor damage here and there, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, but people are taking this as, oh, New York was hit with an earthquake. Oh, uh, that, that's, this is a sign from God. The rapture is going to happen. And, uh, you know, everybody needs to repent. And it's just like, oh, you know, <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I could have a, a few phrases for that. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to do that on a, on a public live stream, but, um, but just no. Um, first of all, um, eclipses are common, uh, Earthquakes and other natural disaster -y type phenomenon are pretty common during eclipses. Uh, the idea of an earthquake and a solar eclipse at the same time is re it's common enough to be written into Vedic astrology. It's common enough. So the fact that there was a very minor earthquake in New York City, uh, you know, there was a double one. Yeah, okay, unusual, unusual, but not catastrophic. Um, and the idea that this is somehow a, a signal of the the rapture or whatever. I mean, it's like somebody I think said today on Facebook, they were like, you know, I almost kind of wish there was a rapture. Um, <laughs> and certain people might just like, just be like carried away and be like, okay, now the rest of us can get on. Um, but it was just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that that's, it's just, that's an interesting reaction. Let's just say that people are having to this, this solar eclipse. Um, and, and probably, I mean, astrologically, to be fair, there, it is kind of a momentous month. There is a lot, a lot of stuff going on that, that heralds, if you believe that, and if you follow astrology, then that, that heralds really, really big changes. And this eclipse in particular is supposed to be, um, the energy of this one seems to be connected to, okay, it's, it's linked with Chiron. And I think I might've said this at the beginning. And I mentioned Chiron is an asteroid and Chiron is the wounded healer. Um, now, Something that really interesting about Chiron mythology and the mythology of the eclipse that I was just talking about with Rock and Ketu. Um, Chiron is the wounded healer. So Chiron is a centaur. He's, a, he's an instructor. He's like the instructor of Achilles. He's the instructor of uh, Heracles. Um, and it happens to be Heracles who accidentally wounds Chiron with a poison-tipped arrow. 
Now, Chiron is immortal, and Chiron can't die. Uh, and, and, you, and Chiron is the one who is one of the ones who teaches the art of healing. But now he's been wounded himself, and instead of dying, as you normally would with such a wound, he's kind of living this wound over and over again. I believe with that myth, um, eventually he sort of swaps places with, like, like Prometheus is, is freed. And I know this is also one of the things that Heracles does, is he frees Prometheus, um, who was bound for all of that time for um, <clears throat> basically his trickster, you know, basically opposing the will of Zeus, okay? Um, and eventually, I think um, Prometheus exchanges like his mort whatever his mortality was or whatever whatever he had you know, with with the immortality of uh, Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus and, and Chiron exchanged. I don't think that makes any sense. Of course, to me, I'm sitting there thinking, isn't Prometheus already like a titan? Isn't he already? But I, I you know, in any case, there, there's like a mortal element to Prometheus that he's able to give to Chiron, and Chiron can finally die. So. It, there's this this kind of thing that goes on that's all centered around Heracles, but that that so that's the mythology of Chiron. But um, but as a, as a astrological aspect, I mean, this is directly conjunct the solar eclipse. So this means that it's, and eclipses in general tend to bring about big changes. They're considered to be almost revolutionary in what they do, and they're also considered to. And this one in particular is about it, a lot of it's about uncovering what is hidden. So it's a matter of seeing what's hidden here, and um, you know, being you know being able to bring things to light. So one of the things that the eclipse is supposed to be doing is bringing a lot of truths to light, things that people were not seeing. And the fact that this is conjunct with Chiron suggests to me that this may be a lot of old wound stuff that's coming up and coming out. Okay, again, looking at it from an astrological perspective, that seems to be. What the what what is going to be the thing with this eclipse? Because it always brings it always brings seems to bring something that's unexpected, an unexpected element into into things. Um, so this made me think about um, a, a particular thing. Um, actually, before I get to that, I wanted to talk about one other myth that concerns Rahu, and that is the myth of um, Jalandhara. Now, Jalandhara is another Ashura who manages to gain worldly power. Uh, he gains power over you know, what they call the three worlds, the Saha, you know, the, the three worlds. Um, and <clears throat> that's, it's, it's Bu, Bu, Va, and Sva, yeah, the three worlds, that's what they are. So, it, it, so he's, and, and when he gains this kind of kingship, a lot of times what happens, and this is repeated in a lot of Hindu mythology, where you will have a, um, the way you have an Ashura who gains some kind of power, worldly power, and then thinks that they're just so awesome. Um, and of course, they only seem to want to possess the uh, most, they always want to possess the most beautiful woman. They always want to possess, um, they want to take as their wife, you know, a woman who, you know, obviously it, it is basically like a token, like a testament to how great they are. Okay. It's never about her. It's about how great they are. Look at, look at this, look at this. Look at this wife that I've acquired, right? Uh, we see this in the Durga Saptashadi, you know, where um, uh, the Mahisashura is, uh, wants to possess um, Durga, and Durga says, yeah, fight me. Um, basically is how that goes. And she just basically says, well, yeah, yeah, you might be great and all that, but uh, I don't give myself to somebody unless they defeat me in battle. Um, so she's, so there's that element, but in this one, what happens is uh, Jalandhara sends um, his, sends Rahu as an emissary, and he sends him to Lord Shiva because they just, he's decided that the wife that he's worthy of him is Parvati, okay? Now, anytime you mess with Parvati when it comes with Shiva, it's never, it never really goes well. Um, so he goes to Shiva and tells Shiva that because he's this dirty aesthetic in, in the forest or whatever, that he's not worthy of a wife like Parvati. She deserves somebody who's got all this power in all the world worlds. So Shiva responds by his third eye exploding, and a demon jumps out called Kirtimukha. Okay, and this is a demon that has the head of a lion and an emaciated body. Now, the emaciated body is worth noting because if you look uh, again in the Durga Saptashadi, what emerges from Durga's third eye is uh, is uh, Chamunda. Okay, now Chamunda, I, I I've done a podcast on Chamunda. Chamunda has a much older history. But certainly within that narrative, she appears, she's a form of Kali. 
in that narrative and she appears and she's completely emaciated. She's like really skinny, you know, like she's like she's starving. So this lion appears kind of in very similar fashion as this very ferocious head and this starving body because the idea is that this being is a devourer and it's going to go and it's going to and that's what Chamunda does. She just basically takes all the armies of passion and anger and just shoves them in her mouth. And she never gets any bigger. She just, she continues to be emaciated. It's just this, this form. And so similarly, you have this kind of emaciated body, lion body, but with this fierce lion head that's going to devour, uh, threatens to devour Rahu and also threatens to devour, um, you know, um, uh, Jalandara. So, so Rahu, of course, immediately throws himself on Shiva's mercy. And apologizes and throws, and of course Shiva being the kind of deity that he is, he can be really angry and rip your head off in one minute, and the next minute just be like, oh, okay, it's fine. Um, you know, because if you throw yourself on Shiva's mercy, he always responds that way. So Shiva says, oh, okay, fine, you know, I'm going to call off, um, you know, call off the attack of uh, Kirti Mukha. And, uh, and now one of the things that's said is that Kirti Mukha then feeds on I think the way they had put it was the attachments of humans, okay? That's at least one version of it. Joseph Campbell told a different version of it, which is probably, they're probably connected. They're probably just different versions of the story in different um, texts. But the story that he tells is that uh, Kirti Mukha, who was created to devour, now is being told, oh, well, now you're not going to you know, devour, you know, don't do this now. And he says, well, now, now what am I going to eat? And Shiva says, well, um, why don't you eat yourself? So in this particular version, uh, Kirti Mukha starts with his feet and just devours his entire body until this shining face is left. And in fact, Kirti Mukha literally means shining face. And this is a, an image that is often put above Shiva temples because Shiva is so impressed by this shining face, this, uh, this symbol of kind of life feeding on itself. Okay, this this devouring kind of energy that we have with a kirti mukha. This is this is something that's actually I discuss in my religion classes. The idea of kirti mukha. What is what does it mean to be devouring? Because on one hand we can think about it in terms of you know if it's feeding on attachment, then it's just kind of like oh, um, you know we, we tend to think of it just in terms of greed or consumerism or things like that. But kirti mukha is just really the fact that life itself. It, it's it's the sublime realization that life feeds on itself. Okay, that you are all of us feed on life. Uh, you you can't live without food. Your food is either from an animal that you've killed or it's from a plant that you've killed, okay? Because people will say, well, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't kill things. I'm like, yeah, but plants are alive. Um, you always have to kill a living thing, and that's one of the, the weird things about life. That's why people like Schopenhauer say, oh, well, life is probably a thing that shouldn't have been. But that's that's the thing about it. It's, te it's both terrible and beautiful at the same time, and that's kind of the, the mystery of it. Um, so... Yeah, so this idea of this um, this this kind of all-consuming kind of a, a, a figure that we see in connection with Shiva, and as we know, Shiva is a god who is connected with both creation and destruction. Um, I saw this thing, actually. This was a, this was a kind of a ridiculous thing. Um, something on YouTube. There's this woman who's just saying something about, you know, I, I just one of those things I randomly clicked on. And she was just talking about, and again, it was one of those 10 channels where people were talking about, oh, the people who are into Ascension and Ascension stuff. And, um, you know, and, and again, playing that same narrative of the fact that CERN is starting up the Large Hadron Collider and NASA's firing rockets. And this is really an attempt to open a portal and let demons into the world. And I'm just going, oh, God. You know, and it's... Um, there's there's still this this narrative that's going on. It has to be this idea of it's weirdly reminiscent of these ideas of eclipses and auspicious. The idea that the eclipse is somehow opening a portal to something darker. Um, but I, I don't think. And one of the things she had pointed out was that in front of CERN, there's actually a a, a Shiva Nataraj. Um, I have one up in my office upstairs. Shiva Nataraj is basically the dancing Shiva, where he has you know his leg is kind of up, and he's holding the drum of time. And he's got basically a circle around him that's like a circle of flame uh, that represents the destruction. And of course, she was saying, see, CERN has this in front of here because they represent this destructive demonic force. I'm like, and she, and she kept saying, is Shiva a god or a goddess? I'm like, you don't even know who Shiva is. Wow. Um, so it was just, it, it's just, it's just, it's really interesting the way people are trying to take this kind of mythology of the eclipse and kind of turn it into this good evil battle. Um, which I don't think in any of these cultures, I don't think that's exactly what it's meant to be represented as. It can be potentially unsettled or inauspicious energy, but it's not evil energy. Um, you know, it's, it's these, 
you know, the, the, the serpent, the Shiva images, things like that. This is, this is both life and death uh, at the same time. It's a representation of both. And they're interconnected. You don't really have one without the other. So um, now this may seem a little bit of a, a diversion here, but this led me to another conversation I had with somebody this morning and other conversations I've had this week and I, I, about the live stream I did on the authenticity of voice. I've had a few comments on that. Some people have commented, written comments on things. Some people have, you know, who know me personally have called me or left messages or we've talked about it. Or I've just had actual, you know, phone conversations, Zoom conversations with people about it. And one of the things, if we if we kind of go back to that, is one of the things I was talking about is the way um, this was all structured around the idea of baby voice. It's kind of a voice that it often used, uh, and they call it fundy baby voice. So it was often used in like fundamentalist communities. Uh, it, it was kind of a, it, it's, that, it's that little girlish kind of voice that's kind of meant to convey something that's non-threatening, something that's innocent, um, and can often be used as a kind of manipulation. Uh, now, of course, one of the things about that manipulation that maybe I didn't talk about so much there, because again, when I when I feel like people are using that voice, not, not that's just how their voice sounds, like if they're using it as a manipulation, I find myself getting... Uh, I, I, I don't, I usually call it out when I see it and I'll just be like, yeah, um, if you're, if you're using that voice to try to either shame me or say that, uh, I'm morally, morally inferior to you or something, you know, yeah, you know, you know, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't really respond to that. It's like the person who tells me, you know, oh, oh you did, you did this thing. You're terrible. I'm like, yep. Yep. Yeah, I am actually. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't think I'm terrible, but you know what I mean? And I don't, I don't care. I mean, it's not, it doesn't. Those, that kind of posturing doesn't really, really do anything for me. But it's, it, it, what happens with this is that um, you have this kind of voice and people have pointed out that, well, sometimes people use that as kind of a defense as well. Uh, if they feel that they are threatened, that is one way in which you can try to placate somebody. Um, and, and we do, and this is something that you will do. Like if you talk, if you are taught in a kind of situation where somebody uh, is, uh, really kind of out of angry and out of control, maybe violent. You try to de-escalate the person by talking calmly, right? You, you try to take the, take take it down a notch and not not ramp everything up. Um, but then there's then there's the other discussion, and this is what came up a couple of times of a voice that we might think of as the opposite voice, which is, and, and I don't mean just a direct voice. I mean the person who's just like. F you, you're not going to tell me what to do. You're not going to tell me who I am. Like, that's that voice, which a lot of people, I find, equate with the idea of dark feminine. They say, yeah, I'm empowered. I have my voice. You know, you're not going to tell me. And that voice is actually the, the flip side of the coin from the baby voice. They do the same thing. One is a response to the other, usually. Because if somebody comes to you and kind of talks to you in that kind of moralizing tone and you say, you know, bugger off, you're not going to tell me. I mean, and I, I do that too. I've done it too, where you just, you get, you get tired of it. Like, you know, stop, stop trying to use this thing like to show that you're the calm, nice one and you're the professional one, you know. But it's a response. But um, with this idea of Chiron being linked to the solar eclipse, this really kind of something, the fact that we had this conversation, I've had this conversation a couple of times, really made me think about the fact that um, when we're talking about authenticity of voice, okay, and again, I feel like one of the things that the eclipse energy is trying to do is trying to, I mean, again, if you're going to look at it astrologically, I realize not everybody accepts that, but if you're going to look at it from the point of view that of truths being revealed, um, I'm seeing a lot, like I, when I do readings for people, the first house is like ten of swords in the first house for everybody. It's like, you know, whatever's inauthentic is dead. I mean, you know, this is kind of moving people in this direction of um, of authentic voice. But what does that what does that mean? Because when one moves out of a space where they've been perhaps very very meek and mild, and oh, I'm just going to stand in the corner and not not make any trouble, and then they change and they have this voice that comes out. Uh, that is just very, very angry and says, F you, F all of you, everybody get away from me. Don't tell me what to do. And some people uh, uh, will reinterpret, that's what I've said, people will kind of, they kind of look at it on an axis. They say like, well, women either, so the woman's either the sweet little girl or she's the bitch, right? I mean, which which one are you? And just like the virgin whore axis dichotomy that we seem to create in this culture, it's another false dichotomy. They're really... 
This is really two sides of the same coin because one is a reaction to the other. Both might be used in a way to keep people from being, um, you know, it might be used as a defense, okay? As a defense against somebody. So you're either gonna, you're gonna either take the direct angry defense or you're gonna try to do it in a way that you kind of come across as non-threatening you know, just to try to, uh, to sweet talk somebody out of, uh, you know, being in your space, um, or even using that kind of a voice in a way that is, that is meant to be, um, it's actually meant to be a mean thing, but it's, but it's made to come across in this almost ironic kind of way, I guess, the, the way that it does that. But, um, but okay, so I, I I thought about a couple of these cards. I have the this is the Osho Zen Tarot. This is not my new new, new spare tarot. But there's a card here called Suppression. Okay, and this is the Ten of Wands. And you can see this person who is really um, sort of tied up in knots, and they're kind of in this space. And this is really the card of somebody who's about to explode. Okay, and what they're saying is that this is the result of suppression. So when we talk about suppression of voice, okay, and a lot of that comes from our wounding, that suppression of voice that we have. Um, the question is, how does this, how do we, how do you bring this voice out? When this voice first comes out, it can sound like a really toxic voice because if you've been forced to be, to be quiet or to be demure, and then now, now you've reached the end of your limit and you just, you just unload. Okay. You just unload at somebody or on somebody. Um, I would almost compare it to the way in which if you adopt an animal, um, and those of us who have adopted animals from shelters, sometimes if you adopt an animal that has either been feral or one that has been abused, okay, frequently one that's been abused more than, than the other, because feral cats have to, and, and dogs have to kind of have their own uh, process for being kind of um, domesticated, I suppose. But if you have a, an animal that's been you know, abused in some way, even if you take that animal home from a shelter and that animal's very docile, they can react in a very, very negative way. They can growl at you, hiss at you, hide in the corner, hide behind things, okay? So either there's this angry vocalization, like piss off, get away from me, or there's a, there's a hiding. They're gonna hide somewhere, they're gonna withdraw. And the response to that, I mean, you would not respond to something like that by going and chasing the animal down and hitting with a stick. You know, I mean, it, it's not, the animal's scared. And the animal maybe has been in a confined situation, okay, that suppressed situation, and now is free, and now is just like freaking out because it, it's still you're still responding to the, the the suppression. So, I think the thing that came up was the idea that when one has to use an angry and bullying voice all the time, okay, not a direct voice, okay, not not, it's not not about just speaking your truth and being direct, which also seems to threaten people, and that's kind of a a, a thing that I think I was talking about. But that other voice, when somebody, everything you say to them, somebody has to fight back. They have to be defensive. It isn't that way. Don't this. Don't that. Don't. It, it, that's, that's still, that is still a response to the wounding. That's somebody, somebody who's, the, they, they may, and it's interesting, it was with Rahu Ketu, because people may refer to that as a kind of liberation, right? If we think of Ketu, refer to it as a kind of, I'm liberated now. I can speak my mind. Yeah, but what's coming out of your mouth is venom. And it's because... And, and some, and some, I mean, sometimes it's deserved. Sometimes it's being aimed at people who absolutely deserve it, okay? But sometimes our lifestyle becomes that venom. It just becomes, you want to, you're, you're always on the attack, waiting to attack somebody. And sometimes people who don't deserve to be attacked. Sometimes there's people who legitimately are on your side and you lash out, you can lash out at people. Um, now, to go back to the cat example, what one would do there is, like, if I had a cat that I would adopt, and I, I, have, I don't have any right now, but I used to have, I've had up to four at a time, and when they come into the house, they're usually, I mean, they're, they're walking around, they're looking at everything, they're hiding, they might hiss at you, they might sit there and they, you know, how they, they lick their lips and they, you know, they just kind of, you know, try to make themselves, like, look like you can't see them. Uh, because they're scared and, and you get, and, and a lot of times people get upset and they'll go, oh, the cat doesn't like me. It's like, no, the cat is, is responding to a change in environment. Just because you plan to give this person a nice thing or this person, they, or now they're not in a situation, they have to get used to the idea that they're not going to be harmed. Okay. You have to get used to the idea that, um, you know, the wound is not going to be repeated. 
but the wounds last a long time. And the kinds of emotional wounds we have, especially ancestral wounds and things like that, which seems to be the focus, these are things that have happened over many, many lifetimes. Um, like I'd said about fate in the last one, where fate is just more about like what's in your DNA. Like what, it, because it's not just people's, the um, social environmental behavior of people, it's also what's kind of built into your DNA because the emotional stuff's built in there as well. The reactions are built in based on traumatic responses that may be ancestral, right? So, you know, when, so when I have, you have an animal like that, my, my, my thing with those, I'd be like, okay, you make sure that food is accessible. You make sure that litter box, whatever, is accessible. And then you walk away and you leave the animal, give it its space. If the animal wants to come to you, then fine. If they don't, then you just kind of say, okay, you know, um, you'd be gentle, you'd be non-threatening, but when and you can see that the animal doesn't want to be bothered, okay, you know, just, you know. And, and I remember even when I adopted Mr. Shiva, that's the way he was. He, he's hysterical because he had the cat had these huge eyes. If he was still around today, he'd probably one of these Instagram cats. He's, he had these huge eyes. And in the thing behind me where my TV is, he was behind there. All I could see was these eyes looking at me. It was the funniest thing. But he was, he was like that. And he, he would run. He would hide under the bed. And he would hide under anything he could hide under. So I would just make sure that what he needed was nearby. And then I would just walk away. And then one day, all of a sudden, the cat just went, you know, got curious, went out and got some food, and then suddenly went, meow, it just jumped on my bed. And after that, it was fine. But, um, but again, but if I kept chasing him around going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, no, you, you give people their, their space to kind of, to heal. And I think the same is true of people too. You know, when people lash out and respond in a certain way, the response isn't always to turn around and go, yeah, you want to fight me, bro? I mean, that's not always the response. The response sometimes is just like, okay, you know, that, that person's figuring something out. I mean, and it's not, it's not, this is not about assuming moral superiority because there's no judgment here. It's, it's about, it's not about judging somebody. Uh, it's about just, yeah, people are going through stuff. They're hurting and, and so are you. And so am I. I mean, all of us are, have something that, that wounds us. Okay. They, we have something that, um, that, that, that triggers us or that, that, becomes like a repeat situation. So yeah, you, know, you hold space for that. You say, okay, well, that person's going through that. Just like if I was going through something, I wouldn't want people to jump on me or attack me or whatever, because you know, that th you'd want them to understand what you're doing. And a lot of times people will react to things or act out in a certain way because, because they're acting out of fear. And the question is, well, how do you, how do you, how do you promote a healing response? Okay. And I mean, I don't mean, I don't like the sound to you know, new age or whatever, but, but yeah, but how do you, how do you promote something where that person feels like they can step into their own authentic voice? Um, I think another discussion we were having was about swearing, uh, and people who kind of are raised with the idea that, uh, and I think a lot of us are, we're all raised with parents, you, you know, you don't swear, swearing is not nice, okay? But as we're grown-ups, we all swear, because as Lewis Black pointed out, they're the words that express, you know, rage, frustration, and anger. I mean, we, they're, they're terms that we use. Um, you know, as he said, I think how he put it, he said, if you lost your job and lost everything, like your benefits, everything, and just after being there for like 25 years, he said, you're not going to sit at home and go, oh, fiddlesticks. You know, it, it's, you're going to be, you're going to be, you know, you have this certain thing. But if you constantly feel like you cannot express yourself in that way. Um, and also, I always think it's interesting that swear words are very catonic. They either have to do with sex or defecation, right? Uh, that, think about any swear word. I mean, it, it's going to have something to do with either um, sexual body parts or the ones that you defecate out of, or or or, act, or the actual act of, of that, um, of either. Is um, so there's almost kind of like a suppression of the catonic there, right? With, with that, because that's not that's not polite, that's not orderly, that's not proper, it's not civilized, right? But 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 it is. But it's a but it's but it's a thing. It's a real thing. Um, so I don't know. So it's interesting, but it kind of led me to this other card here, um, which is the Ten of Swords in this one, which those of you who are familiar with Nietzsche might recognize the image of there's a, well, it's not great here, there's a camel, um, camel down here, and the camel turns into a lion and the lion turns into a boy. And what that image actually <clears throat> is, it's, um, I think it's, I believe it's from uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra. It's a, it's a story, the idea that one starts out as a camel and one is very, very docile you know, maybe accepting passive of whatever, whatever judgments there are, whatever's, you know, whatever the socially acceptable thing is. And at some point when they start to find their voice, they turn into a lion and then they start to roar. Okay. And then, um, at some point they stop roaring like a lion and then you become like the child. 
Uh, now, I was doing some stuff recently. I was looking into a heliocentric astrology, which is astrology that's based on the positioning of the sun. And it, and it's different. I mean, a lot of the planetary things are different. You don't have a house system, obviously, because you're not dealing with a horizon line. But you do have... What, what's interesting is the idea of the earth sign. And so your earth sign is the opposite of your sun sign. Uh, so for me, I'm Taurus. The opposite of my sign is Scorpio. And there was somebody, and I'm trying to remember... Um, who it was. I think it was T and Rosemary. I think it was her blog. Uh, it's an astrology. She does astrology and mostly in that, in that one. And one of the things she was talking about is that the way that she had seen it with her experience was that the earth sign is what you were like as a child and the sun sign is what you're like as an adult. And so when I'm reading for Scorpio, the Scorpio child is one who's extremely imaginative. And that absolutely characterized me. But what ends up happening over time is people sort of shame you out of whatever the child is. Whatever the childhood aspect is, you get shamed out of it in some way. You know, that's not, you're not being mature. You're not being, you're, you're living in a fantasy world. You're this, you're that. You, you kind of get, and, and, and if you're a very imaginative and creative person, you know, you, you, you're expected to conform and confine to a certain thing. I mean, this happens to a lot, everybody in some form, right? But I, I really would relate it to that when I read that. I said, yeah, because that, that was, a, I was especially creative as a child. That was like, it's a time in my life I kind of wish I could recapture. I mean, I, I do a lot of stuff now, I guess, but I just feel like I didn't have some of the hangups that I gained as an adult from, from that period of time. But for me as a Taurus adult, yeah, again, obviously much more practical, much more measured, much more grounded in the way that I want to approach things. And really what it's saying is, well, make sure that you're not completely stifling out that childish aspect with, or child... I shouldn't say childish, child aspect that is that is part of us, that is part of who we are and part of our identity um, because we we lose something very important sometimes. And but this is part of but that's the earth sign that ends up getting suppressed in, in favor of the sun sign, which I think is quite interesting there. Um, but uh, and so you so whatever is kind of going on there. Um, yeah, but it basically I feel like so when he talks about moving into the space of the child, um, that's almost like saying, okay, now you're really reclaiming the authentic voice that you had to begin with and allowing that to come out without, I mean, people are still going to be judgy. People are going to criticize you. People are going to, there's going to be people who not like you and not going to like what you're doing. Um, but if you can put yourself back in that, that, that space, and I think it's more than just doing kind of inner child work. Cause I see a lot of people do this, this kind of stuff. Um, I feel almost like it has to be something that goes beyond that um, because I, it's not, it, it's not, I mean, maybe, maybe it starts there. I don't know, but it, but I feel like finding authentic voice is somehow reconnecting with that voice. Um, I mean, you may have a voice that's talking through trauma, talking through wounding. Like how do you, uh, people have talked about that, about the stuff that I write. They're like, well, you know, you're writing all this stuff that's very, very wounded. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's not about, these are not events in my life, but but they are about the kind of wounds that I'm exploring because to some degree they are my wounds. And but but the thing is, you when you tell people, well, you can't talk about that, you can't talk like that. Well, now you're just now you're just doing that again. Maybe not everybody wants to read that, and that's fair enough. But it's not you. You need to have a way. But but in the process of moving, say, from that lion stage to that child stage, you have to be able to work to move through that. And by the time you get to the child stage, then it's kind of like you can be back to that point where maybe you still can find mystery in life. You can still find the joy and the awe and you can still use your imagination and you can still have play. And what other people think really just doesn't matter. I mean, people can call you whatever you want and you're like, whatever, you know, it's just not, it's just not important. And I think we all gradually move towards that. I mean, whether we ever hundred percent get there, I don't know, but it was just interesting in, in light of this, solar eclipse, um, the Rahu K2 dynamic. Um, and Rahu, by the way, doesn't have to be a negative for a lot of people in this eclipse. Rahu, um, can, can really shine a light on a certain aspect of your chart. It can aggrandize it, um, in, in a way that might be positive for you. It might bring you opportunity rather than, um, you know, it might be about increase rather than loss or wounding. Um, but nonetheless, these truths do come out. So anyway, so I don't know. So eclipses, eclipse energy overall is considered to be inauspicious energy. It's, it's unsettled. Um, but that just, just because it has an inauspicious kind of a vibe doesn't necessarily mean that, it, that it's an evil 
and that bad things are going to happen. It, it, but it does mean that one might be pushed through change, and it does mean that you may be confronting truths or confronting wounds. So I don't know. That, that whole idea about the child kind of occurred to me this morning and the idea of, yeah, when you're trying to find your authentic voice, your authentic voice isn't the little, isn't the, the fake baby voice, the authentic voice or, or the judgmental or moralistic voice. It's not the angry response to that voice. It's something else that's beyond that. And that's kind of the thing that occurred to me today in the conversation I had this morning and in other conversations I've had this week. So I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of tying together the eclipse stuff with the fate stuff, with the, with the authenticity of voice stuff in the last few weeks. Um, so rather interesting stuff. So anyway, I hope this was enlightening to you. I hope that, uh, or it, it may be, maybe enlightening or maybe just food for thought. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this live stream. I hope, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that so many of you could join me today because this is like a it's kind of a full house today and uh, which I think is really cool. And uh, I will be posting the replay of this. Um, I mean, it will be on Instagram for a while, I think, and then I'm going to post it over YouTube as well. So uh, I do want to thank all of you for joining me. Definitely stay safe. Uh, as I said, if you're in the path of the eclipse, please don't look it directly in the eyes without appropriate, uh, with the appropriate uh, glasses with the approved kind of lenses, because I would hate to see anybody burn their corneas out. And, um, you know, so, uh, yeah. And if you're not in the path of the eclipse, well, the eclipse energy is still there. Uh, so, yeah, things are a bit unsettled, but, you know, everything everything moves along on its path and, you know, gives us a chance to think about these kind of things. So all of you have a really, really great um, rest of your week, and I will be back next week. Take care.